Fantastic. Okay, so if you think you've had a, had a bad day, always remember that Paul was dragged, was stoned, and then dragged out of the city, and just think, well, and then he got up again and went back in. If your day's been something like that, you know, obviously you can feel sorry for yourself, but otherwise, you know, Paul is really set the standard of what a bad day looks like, was not he? He's saying, <clears throat> I tried to do some good and I got smashed a bit, but um, it wasn't the greatest day ever. Anyway, I'm back now. <clears throat> so that's sometimes the way we have to be, isn't it? We have to deal with uh, lots of trials and tribulations as we, as we see in this scripture. Um, we're going we're gonna to focus on that a tiny bit, but we're mostly going to focus on uh, what true disciples understand from the scriptures and from those experiences, which is that we are stronger together. We're stronger together. Does anyone disagree with that? Because if you are, you might as well leave, because you know, you're on your own anyway, and you don't really care about needing us around you, so you might as well go. <clears throat> but the scriptures are really clear that we are stronger together. People are stronger together. God's people are much, much stronger together. And in this city uh, where these guys have turned up to try and witness to them, and they by the way, you could tell that they're all bowing down to Greek gods, right? Iconium, the icon, that's where that word comes from, uh, and it's, it's the same word. And also, all the gods that they were talking about, Zeus. You've heard of Zeus? You must have heard of Zeus. And Hermes, you might not have heard of, but anyway, he's another one. <coughs> they were bowing down to those guys, they were praying to those guys, and then along comes Paul and his team, and all of a sudden, they're seeing that actually, these are just, these are just false gods. They were false gods. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, Others were the apostles. So the Jews were there. Jews are saying, oh no, no, let's not follow this. But the apostles are there too. And they're, they're preaching their word. They're preaching the gospel about Jesus. And immediately we get the sense that there's a big division. There's a big split between the people. And it's certainly true. Uh, and I've actually seen this happen in our own church in the UK. Um, we were part of a church called Ichthus. And Ichthus... My parents were part of starting that church, the first, the first 14 people, and it grew to 3,000 people. Full of the Holy Spirit, demons being cast out, miraculous healings happen, happening on a fairly routine basis. But that church had a church split. They had a church split. 1,800 people left, 1,200 stayed. 1,800 people became one group, and then actually there were a couple of churches who went independent in the middle. And that was absolutely terrible. Absolutely destructive, negative, and nothing, nothing good about it at all. <clears throat> and so it's true that, like with this situation, we see that there are going to be people who disagree. There's going to be people who've got very strong opinions one way or another. And how we handle that is really important, especially in the church, because we represent the bride of Christ, don't we? And if we are kind of torn apart and you know, not acting like Jesus at all, then we have got not much to say. It says, by this they will know is that you love one another. They will know that you are my church, my bride, because you love one another. Not because you argue and hate on each other, but because you love one another. And so the biblical position is that united we stand, divided we fall. And that's, I think, in Proverbs, that original quote. And we see a couple of examples. And the first one up there says, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. So a lot of people did commit to Jesus and commit to following uh, the way, as they called it then, but they, they were soon called Christians in Antioch. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith and saying, we, we must go through many hardships. It's good if you've got a leader, <clears throat> and I try to be like this, who's open about their own struggles, isn't it? Why is that good? Does anyone know? Why does it help? We're all together. We're all together. It's not like there's some elite people who are just blessed by God and they're, they're doing great and life's lovely for them, and we're all having a tough time here in the, in the, in the congregation. <clears throat> we're all getting challenged. We're all getting <clears throat> battles to get through. <clears throat> My son is working out that I need a drink at this point in time. <coughs> it's not actually, it's to do with my running, <coughs> but I won't go to it. Oh, I might have one. Anyway, I've got to put my note down. On arriving there, they gathered the church together, and sometimes one of the roles of a leader is to gather the church together. It's to say, 
Come on, guys. We need to be together. Let's get here on a Sunday. Let's make sure we're looking out for each other in the midweek. Let's maybe hook up midweek and have a coffee and have a chat and a pray. That is the role of a leader. It's not the role of the leader. It's the role of everyone in the church, isn't it? Because we're all meant to be loving one another. Not just the leader. The leader's not meant to be, oh, right, I wonder if so-and-so's okay. I didn't see them last Sunday. I was like, I mean, I am meant to feel like that. I am meant to be guarding the, the flock and wondering if everyone's okay and praying for those people and speaking to those people. But we can all do it. We can all say, how are you doing? Are you okay? I didn't see you last Sunday. What's happening? What's going on? I didn't see you midweek. What's going on in your life? Are you okay? So they gathered the church together and then they encouraged them, didn't they? And that's part of being united. Is that we recognise or we discern when something's not right. Something's not okay. And we step in. We don't go, I'm living my life. And oh, Sunday's here. Oh, I better care about some other people today. Oh, hi everyone. Hi. And I'm living my life. Monday to Friday to Saturday. Oh, I've got to care about some people. Oh, hi, are you okay? Good. Okay, Monday. Oh, yeah, back to me. That's not how we're meant to be living as disciples of Jesus. We're meant to be outward focused, caring about our family, considering what's going on in other people's lives, and to be perfectly frank, you're never happy when you're living a selfish, independent life anyway, are you? Are we? I'm not. I've tried it. I've tried it. It's very negative. Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, you tell yourself. Yeah, I'm having a good time, I'm having a good time. Yeah, I like getting drunk, I like watching movies, I like doing whatever I want. You don't really, but you're kind of telling yourself that you're having a great life. And reality is, you're having a much greater life when you're interacting with and fellowshipping with other people. It's not good for man to be alone. God designed it that we're meant to be in fellowship. Not mateship, not kind of vague friendship, but fellowship. It's a biblical principle. So then you see in 1 Corinthians 1, so this is you know a little bit further in, it says... I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly, perfectly united in mind and thought. That's a challenge, right? All of you, all of us, need to be united in mind and thought. What does that look like, do you reckon? What do you reckon? Go on, Roger. I'm pretty sure there's something uh, for a study before. Um, it's about kind of like having the same goals for the church, maybe, and for just our own lives. Um, yes. Yeah, I'll say that. Yeah. yeah, having similar goals, having th- things that our, our goal is here as a church is to reach our rap. It is not just to feel good or to tick a box. Our goal here, and we try and say as often as possible, is to reach the lost to, in whatever way we can, whether it's through children's ministry or through elderly ministry or whatever the thing is, but we have a goal to reach people who are unsaved in this church, definitely. That's definitely good. So I agree with that. Anything else? Chris, what were you going to say? As we hear from you, we learn from you. As we learn from you, we imitate you. Good. So Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So obviously the goal of a leader is to pass on the things that he's, he's learning and growing in, and, and or she's learning and growing in, and share the truth of God's word, and then we're all supposed to agree. Actually, I agree with what I've just heard. That's a good truth from the Bible. I'm going to hold on to that. And this morning we were talking about treasuring. We were praying just before the service about treasuring the word of God. And it did come up that actually Elijah prayed the very words that I've got in my sermon, as you'll see in a minute, that the words that are spoken, the truths that we learn, we're meant to hold on to. We're meant to say that that is true for me as well as just the general public. It's true for me, and I'm going to apply that in my life because I'm taking that on humbly. I, haven't, I don't know it all, and I've just learned something new, or I've had it reinforced. So speaking of what it looks like, this is Jesus' version of unity. He looks in John 17, if you want to look it up in John 17, he tells us all about what it's meant to be when we are united. And he's praying to the Father, and he's representing, if you like, a prayer that we should pray fairly often, 
Lord, help us stay together. Lord, unite us, Lord God. Lord, make us one. Look at this. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So he's saying, my prayer is for the entire universal church. Wherever it is in the world, this prayer is for all everyone who believes in the, in the gospel. That all of them, all of them, from every tribe and tongue and nation, every single race, colour, creed, will be one. That they may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. So the Godhead we understand to be three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who are inseparable. They are one. They are so bonded that they can't be separate. And we get the sense that even as Jesus takes on a physical body, the Father is in him still. And the Holy Spirit is in him still because they're spiritual beings within a physical body. The physical body doesn't mean you're not united. My physical body doesn't mean I'm not united with the Holy Spirit. I am. My spirit won't be in this body forever. My spirit will be eternally existing, and hopefully in the most amazing body ever. That's what I'm hoping. You ever for that? Oh, yeah, I want that. I want the best body. That's what I'm hoping for. Just make up for this use of thing. Now, that's the Gnostics. You're not meant to hate your body. That's Gnosticism. That's, that's actually evil. We're meant to thank God for what we've got right now. The tent that withers away and eventually collapses. And thank him that we're going to have a solid building one day that never falls down. But we're meant to be united. Let's have another little look at this. There are a couple of things we could actually probably nail down as the ways that we are united. And the first one sounds negative, but it's wholly true and wholly critical. If you want to have a united church, the fact of the matter is, like Paul and all the others teach in the, in the epistles of the Gospels, you have to remove divisive people. We touched on it last week, actually. And you see here, look, the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds. If you've got someone in your church who's just a very outspoken or very controlling kind of a person, and they've got a certain viewpoint, are they going to be able to resist giving their view all the time, even though it's contrary to the church's view? No, they're not. They're going to get into a discussion with you, and you're going to say, oh, well, I believe in healing. Oh, well, I don't. I think those sort of things finished. They're going to start poisoning your mind with their viewpoint because they're anti what the Word says. Remember what it says about having the same mind about things? We are a church who believes in healing. We're a Pentecostal church, so we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe that Pentecostal things happen still today, that God gives accurate prophetic words. I was sharing with someone just the other day. I had a dream. I went to pray for a young lady, and she'd had stomach pain for years. And the doctors didn't have a clue what it was, and none of her friends knew. And she was suffering with this pain in her stomach, oh gosh, every, basically every day. And I was on mission in Streatham in London, and I, I'm a prophetic person, I'm a prophet. And I thought, I, will go to, I need to go and pray for that young lady. And one of the guys said, yeah, let's go together. It's the best thing to do, go and pay it. And it's the, it's the ethical thing to do as well, for our opposite gen, uh, gender. You want to go a couple of people, make sure there's just a witness as well, just for wisdom's sake. And also, so we went and prayed. And while we were praying, I pro prophesied over her. A uh, verse from, I think it was in John somewhere, it says that these things will come to light. Uh, God will show what the issue is and bring it to light, out of darkness into light. I can't remember the exact verse. And that night I had a dream. And I've dro I woke up, and I might have told you this before, but I'll just tell you again, it's a great story. I woke up and I literally felt like a prodding, like there was a rod inside my stomach pushing out, and I, it was my appendix. And I'm dreaming this, oh, oh man, my appendix is coming to the surface. It's gonna break through the surface, my appendix. And I, and I wake up and I think, oh. I could still sort of feel it, even after the dream, it was so real. I felt like they literally like it was coming out. And I woke up and went, oh, the appendix is coming to the surface. That means that the person I prayed for, the issue is her appendix. And within two days, 
they removed, she was taken into hospital, removed her appendix, and they said if they hadn't got to it sooner, she would have died. Because there's a point with an appendix, apparently it can burst. And then you'll actually, you could die. I didn't know any of this. All I know is God showed me very clearly in a dream, this is what her problem is, Get start praying now, deal with it now. Because she's in trouble. And so I, if you if you got a church and you're saying, we believe God speaks to us, God guides us and he leads us, and then you've got someone in your church going, no, nah, that's all nonsense, no, that finished a long time ago, no, we don't believe in that. That person's actually being divisive against the teaching of the church. And so you might say to them, like, well, sorry, but I know we appreciate your opinion, but we this is a Pentecostal church. You know, you're coming to a Pentecostal church, this is what we believe. Please could you just not be trying to push another kind of perspective? We might have to say that to someone. Now have a look at this. It says we Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who create divisions. Do you know there are people in churches who deliberately Deliberately, this is really true. I've just seen it. It just happened in a church in Ballarat. Someone will join the church and then start to undermine the leader. Oh, I'm not sure about Jay. I, oh, I think it's a bit dodgy. Yeah. I don't know. You're welcome to follow him if you want. They start sowing seeds of doubt. Yeah, I'm not sure that he's really, um, you know, very genuine or whatever they're trying to say. They're trying to undermine the leader so that the people in the congregation begin to think, oh, I don't, I don't know if I can trust this guy. Yeah, I might not listen. And they start to put a wall up and they start to protect themselves. Or oh, maybe he is a bit dodgy. I mean, look at his car. Okay? Look at his car. We saved that for that, by the way. Also, we sold our Prado for 7000 We bought that for 9500 We got given $1,000 and we used $1,000 of our savings uh, because I just started working and I got extra money. Okay? That's how we paid for it. It did not come out of church finances. But someone might start to intimate that. Yes, it was an amazing blessing. And I'm absolutely, thank you, Lord. I got that car. The guy dropped the price from 12700 to 9500 Just And I, I was the first one who saw it. And I had been hearing from God. I've been praying, Lord, I feel like this is the right car. But we'd only been looking at the cheaper ones, the 2003 models to 2009. And I looked online, and the best models are 2009, the new model, the new shape. And I'm like, oh, we can't afford that, though. They're way more expensive. And then lo and behold, price drop. And I see it, and I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, we're very interested. And guess what? We got it. And that's how God favors and blesses people when they're being, you know, putting God first. It's great, isn't it? But definitely, I'm not stealing from the church, okay? But if someone ever starts to say these things, this is true, it happens. And do you know what happens? If you're, if you're running your church properly, you have to discipline the church. You have to say, excuse me, you need to stop saying those things. If you hear the living said again, we're going to ask you to leave the church. You have you, the Matthew 18 model is you present to them, look, I don't really like this attitude. It's, it's not godly. It's not in the Bible. It's actually opposite of the Bible. Can you please can you please stop saying those sort of things? You have to correct people. And if they don't like it, they might carry on and then you go back with someone else and say, look, we're not messing around. We genuinely mean you, you need to stop being like this because this is actually ungodly and, and unspiritual, you need to leave. The third thing is that disfellowship. Uh, so I know somebody was, you know, sent a letter, disfellowship, you're, leaving, you're not to come to this church anymore. You are clearly a divisive person. And then you find out, when you look at the, the history, guess what they did in their last church? Exactly the same. They have a, a, a rebellious spirit. They're going around thinking they are better than everyone else. They know more than everyone else, even the leader. Because they've never been trained or, you know, but they but they do know more than the leader. It is shocking. To actually see it happen is unbelievable, but it really does. Titus 3.10, I used this recently, warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. This is the Matthew 18 model. After that, have nothing to do with them. In your lives, in our lives, we're going to have people who are always causing problems causing friction, causing arguments. And I, I advise you to say, look, I'm not actually, you know, if you keep, you keep undermining what I believe, if you keep trying to suggest that I'm, I'm delusional or whatever, I actually don't appreciate that. If you can't stop that, I don't really want to keep having conversations with you because you're actually, you're, you're being divisive between me and my church. I love my church, I love God, 
I want to do the right thing. Can you stop trying to undermine that piece? Well, not once. Then try again. Oh, I don't know. I don't think it's really nice. Seriously, it's not up to you to tell me what I'm supposed to do. Can you stop, please? One or twice. Third time, you need to say, honestly, I don't want to talk to you about spiritual stuff at all from now on. In fact, I feel like you're really quite anti me at the moment. Can you just leave me alone for a bit? I need a break. All right, you have to separate yourself from people like that because they're going to poison your mind. Do you remember what it says at the top there? They're going to poison your mind with something that's not true. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 says, take note of anyone who does not obey the instructions we have given in this letter. So anyone who's not following the Bible deliberately, do not associate with him so that he may be ashamed. I love it. The hardcore church of the first century. It's hardcore, man. That's how you do it. That's how you keep the unity. Because you cannot have egotistical, rebellious people trying to run the show. Because God, this is God's church. And God's got an order in his church. And he needs it to be respected. The second thing we, we've got to focus on is this. So number one, remove divisive people from your life. But number two, we want everyone to walk well. Everyone. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. And I like to think of this as a spiritual suggestion. I might be stretching it a bit, but but look what happened. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. So Maurice, stand up on your feet! Oh, did I really jump on this time? Oh, dear. It's worth a try, right? It's worth a try. Too much warning. <laughs> Too much warning. Stand up on your feet, boy! So we want to succeed. We want others to succeed in their walk with Jesus. We're not going, this is all about me. I'm going great with God. Oh, I don't know about you struggling, are you? But I'm going great, praise God. I'm not, maybe not worshipping like I do. Um, that is not what God wants. He wants us to be going, who's not walking well with God right now? Who's feeling a bit spiritually lame? Let me go and help them. But look what this says. This is what Elijah prayed this morning. We must challenge others to stand up and take responsibility for their own outcomes. Paul did not go and grab this guy and start, oh, I'll help you, I'll help you, oh, come on, I'll carry you. What he did is he, he prayed after, after the man who listened chose to believe the message. The message was preached, but it was the person, individual person's response or responsibility is to believe it. I can't make you believe the gospel. I can only preach the gospel. But you've got to decide, yeah, I'm going to agree with that. For me, I'm going to agree with that. I'm going to get united with that word. And say, this is true for me. I'm just, do you know what? I'm deciding. I don't care how I feel. I'm deciding this is true for me. I can get up and walk. I can get up from this place of loneliness, of brokenness, of struggle. I can get up and walk. I believe that's true. And then we can see breakthrough. But you know, you can resist getting well. You can say, no, 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 no. I want to stay on the ground, thanks. I like it down here. You can feel sorry for me. I like that. That's, that's nice when you feel sorry for me. Yeah, oh, it makes me feel special. Right? The lame man at Bethesda, Bethesda, Jesus said to him, do you want to get well? Do you actually want to get well? Or do you want to keep you know, feeling sorry for yourself? Or do you want to keep getting money from other people? There has to be a process where we determine in our spirit, I determine God is going to bring me out of this place. I decide, I believe that. I'm going to have faith. I don't need to feel it. I'm just going to decide it. I'm going to be well and God is my rock and God is my fortress and God is my deliverer. And God is going to heal me. He's going to heal me, praise God. I don't have it yet, but I'm declaring it now, from the beginning, right now, I'm coming out of this season. And we war, we have to fight sometimes. I've been in this season. It doesn't feel great. It's horrible and dark and miserable. But your words are laced with power. Laced with power. You decree over yourself what the spiritual entities will fulfill. Whether they're demonic or angelic. 
I'm not going to be great this week. It's going to be a really crappy week. Demons are sitting there going, oh, lovely easy week. Don't even have to fight for this one. Let's just ransack his life. Because he's just declared out of his own mouth that he's going to have a crap week. We've got him. That was easy. I didn't even have to try. The next day, you wake up feeling a little bit better. So, that, oh, he's looking a bit happier. Quick, go and whisper in his ear. It probably won't work out. They'll probably reject your work. You probably won't get this situation under control. There's probably... And you're sitting there going, yeah, that's right. You agree with him! Then it's easy. It's easy for the demonic. The demonic are like, this is great. This is so easy. This is... Thanks for giving me this guy. He's really easy work. We have to be united with what the word says. We have to be united with our love for one another. And we have to be united against the enemy. We have to be united in our, sp- our body, spirit, and mind. Body, spirit, mind, and soul, and all the other bits. We have to be all in one. I am all for the truth. I'm only going to accept the truth in this body, in this mind, with these emotions. We have to battle sometimes. And lastly, we have to give the, gl- the glory to God. We've touched on this a lot recently because I think God just wants to... I think God is just dealing with pride in the church generally, across the whole world actually. I think sensational church is coming to an end. I think big, big flashy church is, is, is laced with pride. It's using that word laced again. But there is a lot of ego and a lot of look good and everything. And it can detract from glorifying God for who he is. That's not to say we can't use technology and we can't look, you know, make a good effort to sound good and all that. But I think there's a very thin line between doing that and then performing. You know, we end up performing. Oh, aren't we slick? Aren't we great? Let's have a few mistakes in the keyboard, shall we? That's why I keep telling Dee. I know you're amazing, but can you make some false mistakes on purpose? <laughs> she dies every time she makes a mistake. She's like, oh, I've done it wrong again. But bless her, she's brilliant. She's brilliant, isn't she? She's doing great. But it's okay to make mistakes and get up again because a righteous man rises seven times. Rises from where? The floor. He had a tumble. Okay, I stumbled in sin. God, I'm sorry. Lord, lift me up. Help me. Help me. Strengthen me so I don't do that again. We rise again. But we don't play like we're just perfect. We tell we're honest with each other. Paul and Barnabas were basically being treated like gods and they said, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. I've had a year, well, not, I don't know if it was a full year, but I've had a, a long time where I've been in what's called uh, a, a dark season of the soul, or dark night of the soul, where I feel I can't hear from God accurately. And I've had it a few times in my life where God moves himself away. It's in Hes- it talks about, and he does this with Hezekiah, where he moves away to see what's in his heart. So things are not all jolly and lovely, you're not feeling all close to God, but actually, He's still there. And now I can't just live by my emotions, I have to just decide. By faith, I'm just going to decide that God's with me and He loves me. Even though I can't feel anything. So, it's, it's a season. And look, lastly, one, one, uh, Psalm 133 for this one, it says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there... The Lord bestows his blessing. There's a serious plus point to being united as a family. Is that God bestows his blessing. And I do think, I still hold on to that dream that Nikki brought. About us sharing tables and being in close proximity. And being united as a family. That needs to happen first before God's presence is going to turn up. And then look at this. True disciples of Jesus, they understand we need to stick together. I said, you might sound like a worldly phrase, but it isn't. It's a biblical phrase. It actually says that um, there is a, there's a friend who, who sticks closer than a brother. And look at the language in this Hebrews 2 passage that Kelvin brought last week. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, by a new and living way, open up for us that his body and since we have a great high priest over the house of God let us draw near to God and a little bit further down 23 let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess and let us 
How do we let us hold unswervingly? It tells you. Verse 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. The way that we, us, hold on to what we believe is that we all spur each other on. Because we're united. And we care about each other. And we say, do you know what? You might be struggling, but I tell you, don't forget what happened last year. Don't forget when you had that moment with God and you felt his presence and you cried and you were joyous and it was a good time. Don't forget that one. I know you're feeling a bit rubbish today, but don't forget that. We spur one another on. And we say, hey, don't forget, I've seen this one be answered before. Oh, here's a testimony. And we spur someone on with a little bit of encouragement saying, this has happened before. Don't start thinking this can't happen. It can happen. It has already happened. I know for a fact it's happened. So we spur one another on in our faith. And lastly, we're family forever. And um, there's a pastor called Rick Warren. He, he runs a tiny little church around the UK and uh, the US. It's about 10,000 people. It's not, not very big. Uh, it's a tiny little thing. Um, but he sends out a, 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 a word of devotion. And I got it this morning. I wrote this sermon a week ago. But I'm going to post it on our church page because he talks all about this. He talks about being family forever. Now, in this passage, they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Sometimes we should be thinking, I'm here for the long term. There's a thing called being flighty. I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, Elijah. But when I, I was asking God to speak directly to me about my own life, and, and basically I felt God had been speaking to me about being like Lazarus, that I was going to be raised from the dead, I'd gone from, through a divorce, I was going through it, I was still going through it, but God was talking to me about how he was going to raise the dead. And I knew, and I was feeling regretful about all the crappy stuff that I'd done, and how I'd ruined things, and how I'd, I'd sinned so much. And I was feeling, oh, this is so hopeless. But the, but the passage in Joel 2 kept coming up. It says, I'll give you back the years that the canker worm has taken away, or the locust has taken away. I will give them back to you. So these things have been stolen from you, but in this season, I'm giving you back what the enemy has stolen from you. I was like, oh God, please let that be true. Please let that be true. Oh God, I feel like you're saying, and it's coming up so much, it feels like it is you, but I need outside confirmation because right now, I'm so broken and mashed emotionally. I don't know if I'm really just conning myself or what, trying to you know, give myself some fake encouragement. And a prophet called John Paul Jackson came to our conference. And I was part of getting him to come because I knew what an amazing uh, speaker and teacher he was on prophetic dreams and ministry. And he came, and at that conference, he spoke a, uh, a couple of things, a great night. And at the end, he was about to leave, and I was like, oh, God, I feel like I need to talk to him. And I said, my mum was there. She'd come to visit for the day. I said, oh, mum, I feel like I should talk to him. She said, just go, just go, Jay. Go talk to him. And I could see he was heading towards the side of the tent, and he was going to get in his car and go to the airport. And I had my Elijah with me, and I said... Oh, I might, take, I might take Elijah with me. I, I took Elijah with me, and I ran, like, quickly, with, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I wanted to hear the word of God for my life so desperately, I was pushing myself to get there. I've got to get there before he gets in the car. And I got to the car, I ran to the tent, and he was about to go, and I said, oh, hi, hi, John Paul, I'm really sorry. And he said, you had an American accent, I'm not going to absolutely smash it to bits. <laughs> no, I can't do it, I can't do it. And I said, hi, John Paul. He said, hi, hi. Anyway, I said, um, I'm really sorry to delay, but is there any, any chance you could just pray for me or prophesy or something? He said, sure. I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, it was a bit like that. I'd love to. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he says, and I'm thinking, oh, God, please tell me. Tell me about Lazarus. Lazarus. Tell me about Joel. Please, Lord, tell me the truth. And he went straight away again. Oh, Lord, I just thank you that you're going to raise the dead in this young man's life, like Lazarus, Lord God. Lord, you're going to give him back the years that have been stolen from him. He just, oh my gosh. Oh, I can feel emotional right now. And he just repeated the word for word. He said, I'm, I'm going to, he's going to raise you from the dead. He's going to give you back all the years that have been taken from you. And he just prophesied this over me. And it was 100% it's true that I've been, my life has been redeemed. Now in a beautiful marriage with beautiful children. And okay, something like that. <laughs> but, but Elijah also got prayed for. And he got prayed, and, 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 and God said to me, You've got to have a heart. 
father him well because he's got a flightiness, a flightiness. And flightiness is when we're ready to just jump off and leave any five seconds. We're ready to go, oh, we just need a new thing. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Told you. <coughs> Told you. It's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> terrible. Literally, I have to grab him like, so often. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> but flightiness is not to do with unity. If you're ready to leave every five seconds, you're not united. You're not united. This is your family. This is your family. Pointed to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my, my brother, my sister, and my mother. That's Jesus saying, You know, this is my real family. My natural family are really lovely and whatever. I hope they make it to heaven and I pray my heart out. But ultimately, my long term eternal family is the family of God. Ephesians 2. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Or family, it says in another trans- translation. So be devoted to one another in love, honour one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. That's what we're meant to be doing for one another. And lastly, practice hospitality. Have people round. Go out for a coffee. Be connected. Our response today is this. Looking around the church and thinking about the people who are away, which brother or sister do you not know very well? Because they're not just an acquaintance. They're a brother or a sister. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Really. And Marcy and I have got, I feel like Marcy's my sister. We talk like this. Because it's true. We're eternally brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not just people we see at church. We're brothers and sisters. We're to love each other like brothers and sisters. And that means we need to spend some time together. That's what that other bit was about. Who could you hang out with more and be hospitable to? Who might you go and have a coffee with or come in, come up and connect with or have a meal out or just invite around your house just to hang out? There's going to be people we could do that for. But more important, I feel like today is quite the day where this particular one needs to be addressed. Who could you ask to pray with regularly? I feel like God is saying we need to have one-on-one connections with people where we've got someone we pray through our issues with. Not just necessarily hanging out, but one that we regularly meet up with and pray with. Maybe there's a guy your age or your background, a lady your age background, something similar in common already, and you think, yeah, we could hook up. Let's hook up once a week or just chat over the phone and just pray through this stuff together. And then what connect group or team could you join to help build up this church? There's a passage in 1 Corinthians 12 and it says that he's placed us in this church. God has placed us. Only, the only reason to go somewhere else is if he specifically needs you somewhere else and gives you a very clear direction. That's the reason you're going there is because you need it in another church. And we've been praying for families to join our church because there's certain things we do need in the church. And so he will move people. He will move them occasionally. To come and build up the church. And that's that's meant to happen. But once you're there, you've got to get involved. And when you're in, you've already been here for a while, you've got to get involved to build up the kingdom. Let's close in prayer. Let's close in prayer. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you for today's word. I thank you that uh, being united is all just fundamentally important to getting victory in our own lives and in the lives of others. Lord, I thank you that we reap what we sow both good and bad. So that means the good side of it means that when we choose to be united, when we choose to speak well of each other, we choose to build each other up, we choose to pray for one another, we choose to be outward focused and we choose to connect on a regular basis so that iron sharpens iron. Lord, we are doing things that that honour you and that means we will get answered prayers. We're not causing division, we're walking in unity. Lord, I particularly pray that we'd all be united in heart and mind and soul and strength Lord, that we'd all be determined to make an impact on our Iraq and the surrounding areas. Lord, that we have that goal, first and foremost, to build your kingdom. Lord, don't let it be about us. Lord, forgive us for where we're pretty insular or selfish. Help us to start dying to self in that area. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. And Lord, I just pray as well that you bring people together. 
we should be praying together on a regular basis so we can see ongoing breakthroughs, Lord God.